Hello, friends, and welcome to Impact Everywhere, the podcast that looks for people having a positive impact in unexpected places. My name is Benjamin Von Wong, and today I'm really excited to introduce to you Josh Balk. That's B-A-L-K. Josh is the Vice President of Farm Animal Protection from the Humane Society of the United States, and he is passionate about saving farm animals from suffering. Don't worry, this episode is actually quite inspirational. We don't spend too much time talking about animal suffering, but instead focus on the amazing transformation that has been happening over the last few years and what are some exciting innovations to come. Josh is responsible for some of the biggest legislative wins in the United States, including most recently Proposition 12, which bans the sale of caged animals, egg, pork, and veal in California, which is awesome. Josh and I have met a couple times at different cafes, always just exploring different possibilities of collaboration. And while that hasn't happened just yet, I still remain hopeful, maybe when COVID calms down a little bit. Anyways, I wanted to have Josh on this show, both for his perspective, but also the lessons that could be gleaned from the way change happens in his world. This is Josh Balk, and here he is talking about how they view change. So we view change as this, is... Where are most of the animals suffering? How intense is their suffering? And do we have an actual chance to stop the suffering? Do we have a chance to win? And when you combine those three equations about where to really focus your actions to help animals, you land on abolishing cage confinement of animals where hundreds of millions of these animals are confined, egg laying chickens, mother pigs, baby veal calves, and you simultaneously focus to reduce the number of animals who are raised for food to begin with. And that combination reduces immense amount of suffering in a way that's realistic. I I have big dreams, I have moonshots, but also the animals deserve us to be practical in change. And we have to actually have tangible results. So the way to do it, in my mind, is legislatively, we make it criminal activities to treat animals in this way. Hey, we ban dog fighting. We ban cock fighting. Those are crimes. It should also be a crime to confine an animal where she can't turn around her whole life. So we, we make it a crime to treat animals in that way and also mandate that the products sold in the stores don't come from operations that treat animals that way. Okay, we got the legislative work. Corporate work. We campaign, and there's numerous ways of campaigning, focusing on the biggest food companies to mandate their supply chains, eliminate these practices to begin with. So as an example, for your listeners, imagine McDonald's. They sell about 2 billion eggs a year. So we campaigned and we got McDonald's to announce that all of their eggs via Faison will come from cage-free operations instead. Talk about efficiency of change. Imagine how many individual consumers we'd have to persuade to stop buying eggs from caged hens when you get one victory with one company like McDonald's and then poof, two billion eggs per year are switched to cage free. So that's how we make change. Corporate policies like McDonald's, legislative policies, and finally the last component is to work with the food service industry. That's an industry that runs the dining operations at tens of thousands of colleges, universities, hospitals, prisons across the country to change their menus to instead Our estimate was about 7% of their menus were plant-based, not using animal products at all. Our goal is to get to 50% of the menu being all plant-based by 2025. That will save, according to our estimation, about 750 million animals per year. And we keep moving in that front. Now, that's our strategy. My moonshot is eventually, over the next 10, 15 years, to abolish all these confinement practices have factory farms basically crumbling down to to the point that they're not going to be duplicated. They're not going to be rebuilt. There's no point of putting in new ones because of all these laws, because of these corporate policies. And all of a sudden, all of these animals who are raised for food, they have a much better life. And most of us are eating predominantly, at least, more plant-based foods. So that's my mood shot in the next 10, 15 years. And beyond that, you know what? I don't know if I have such a vision to even look beyond that. Thanks for exploring this, this string out of how change happens in your world. I find it really interesting that you go straight to the source, right? Like you, you go straight to the big companies and you hit them where it hurts. Is it because 
you find that to be the most effective way for large scale change to happen versus, let's say, consumer facing campaigns? What is the role of the consumer in these big dialogues between monolithic giants of industry in the campaigns that you fight? When I view consumers, I look to major corporations as consumers. I look to Walmart as a consumer. I look to Safeway and, and Albertsons and Denny's and IHOP as consumers because they are. They're the ones that buy billions of eggs a year. They're the ones that buy millions of pounds of meat a year. And if we can campaign to get them to change, to force their suppliers to eliminate the worst of the worst practices, that's how we make an impact fast. That's how we can make an impact large and affect even more animals. Now, let's talk about individual human consumers. You, me, your listeners, every meal that we eat, we really have a choice. We can choose to support these practices uh, of confining animals in cages, or we have a choice to support practices that are better for the world, that are better for our health. And that is by eating more plant-based foods. My dad ate the typical American diet for 77 and a half years of his life, but now is starting to eat more plant-based foods and he's feeling better than ever. So it's never too late to get started. Someone like my brother, he loves meat as much as anybody, but he does things like Meatless Monday. Everybody is on this team. I don't care whether you're the most ardent meat eater or you're vegetarian, we can all collectively do better. We're all trying to make the world better off. None of us want to support cruelty animals. So what I would say is, hey, let's all together take some steps in the right direction by eating more plant-based foods. Thank you for that. Distributors are like this self-fulfilling prophecy in a sense, because like just based on the proximity of where you place a product and the ease of access actually determines people's consumers' habits. So I love this idea of effective altruism within the distribution space. And I think you're really onto something there about just going straight to the top and making sure that consumers at the very least have the choice. When we parallel this to, let's say, the plastics issue, people don't even have the choice to avoid plastics. Nobody wants to go and have like zillions of single use plastic everything, but the choice has been taken away. And I think what you're advocating for is making sure that choice is even a possibility. A couple of decades ago, like non cage free eggs was just not even a thing unless you went to a farmer's market because it just wasn't even an option. And I think there's something really beautiful there. There is. And you're right how things have changed as much as they have over the years. If I wanted to get some soy milk back in the day, I'd have to go into like the crazy vegan section of my local co-op and it came in a box. And if you had a choice between that or some orange juice, and they both you know, were equal in terms of the taste to add to your cereal. But now every single major grocery store in the country has plant-based milk in the dairy section. In fact, now many of the largest grocery stores actually have plant-based meats in the meat section. So we're talking about things like the Beyond Burger, Impossible Burger, products you know, like Field Roast. Now there's plant-based eggs in, in, in the market too. And so there are myriad ways that we can eat delicious foods now that are convenient, that have a very similar taste and texture of what we grew up with. And so now hey, let's just take these easy steps forward. Let's try these products. Let's bring them home. Let's, let's give them to our family and friends. And all of a sudden, it does become just part of our cultural zeitgeist. These plant-based foods are just part of who we are. It's what we do. This is what we eat. In fact, if you look at plant-based milk, most people who buy plant-based milk also consume dairy. It's not about all or nothing. They're just taking some steps. Also, most people who buy the plant-based meat also buy meat. Some people might look at it they're like, oh my gosh, how could they buy both plant-based meat and meat? I look at it as a good thing. I want people who eat meat to eat this stuff too. Those are some good steps. And yes, you're exactly right. It is easier than ever to buy these products. And that is one of the reasons why I have more hope than ever before. There's a great saying in the vegan environmental movement, which is you don't want everyone to go vegan. You just need everyone to eat a little bit less meat. And I think that's definitely what you're advocating for. When I look Back to that moonshot vision of yours with the, you know, factory farms dying in the sidelines. <laughs> I think of how change happens in the world and 
it's rare that a paradigm shift truly happens until something exponentially more effective and better takes over the market. The reason we don't use fax machines anymore is because the internet is like exponentially better at getting information across. You've talked a lot about change in the form of legislation, in the form of just like these micro stages to reduce the suffering in animals. And I think that's one aspect of it. What do you see as far as like the visionary stuff in terms of what's the Tesla of the food world? What's going to come in and just sweep people off their feet where they just go, oh, it makes absolutely no sense for us to grow something with the sole purpose of converting grain into meat. We need something else. What is that Tesla? To produce meat, you have to grow all these crops and then you have all these crops that people could eat directly. Instead, you're feeding to all these animals. How does that make any sense in terms of efficiency? Even if you don't care about all the extra greenhouse gas emissions that are thrown into the air, even if you don't care about the suffering of these animals, if you just care about efficiency, how does that make any sense to grow food that we could eat ourselves, but then we don't eat it, we feed it to someone else, and after many months or years, we finally eat the flesh from that creature? That makes no sense. So that's why part of you know the Tesla model is, is, is efficiency, is the efficient way to do it is growing the plants to be eaten directly and whether they are whole foods or they're turned into plant-based meat. Now, the reason why that makes so much sense is because none of us go out and buy chicken or eggs or milk because we love the idea about torturing animals. Oh my gosh, I just want to be part of putting more greenhouse gas emissions in the air. Oh, I just want to destroy family farmers and rural communities. I just want to harm my health. That's why I eat these products. No one does that. When people eat those products, which I did for most of my life, we do because it tastes good and it was convenient and it was affordable. When these plant-based products become even more of the norm and the economies of efficiency start to catch up to reduce the cost, all of a sudden, everything's going to align with them even more. All of a sudden, it's going to be more affordable to buy these plant-based meat, eggs, and dairy. All of a sudden, because of more innovation, what you can do with plants, it's going to taste even better than ever. And each year, there's going to be more innovation in taste uh, and texture. And it's going to be better for our health so we don't have all the fat and cholesterol. So that makes total logical sense. And it just takes a little time for our culture to get to that logic. And it takes a little bit of economies of scale to get to that point where it is going to make even more sense when it comes financially. And the second part of it, I said that there's two bars, plant-based and the other part, this is further down the line. This is a bit of a, I don't know, moonshot. This is more of like, at least get into space shot. This is cultivated meat where instead of raising all of the animal to kill, then you only eat her wing or her breast. Instead, grow parts of the animal within a growth promoting medium. And when the cells grow, they turn into muscle, turns into flesh, flesh is meat, and you eat that directly. This isn't some new idea that we're breaking here on this podcast. This is an idea talked about with Winston Churchill decades ago about the absurdity of growing entire animals when you're just eating part of them. And so between plant-based and cultivated meat, that's the future. That's the Tesla. That's going to save billions of animals, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and hopefully reduce leading causes of death for us all um, as well, including heart disease, uh, cancer, and, and other illnesses that are certainly preventable. That's amazing. I want to touch upon, in the first part of your answer there, you talked about the importance of shifting culture. And I think of when you try to attack someone's diet, <laughs> I think this is why vegans have such a bad rep. You're actually attacking not just what they eat, but their entire culture around it. It's like, you can't attack my grandma's meatloaf, right? This is what I've grown <laughs> up with. This is what my people are known for. It becomes like very defensive. And this idea of jousting for moral high ground, like people get very defensive and they're like, oh, why am I like, you're calling me a bad person. And so I'm wondering, how are you accounting for the, the shift in culture like within the work that you've done at the Humane Society, is this something that you try to tackle, whether it's through the arts, through conversation? Like, how does that piece of the puzzle play into movements? Who wants to be called a bad person? No one does. Even bad people don't want to be called bad people. The good news is that most of us, in my mind at least, aren't bad people. Most of us don't want bad things to happen because of their choices in their food purchasing. 
Uh, and that's my mindset going into it. When I first started about these issues, I certainly was judgmental. And I lived up to the, you know, that, that vegan stereotype of pointing my fingers out and shaming people and forgetting about what really got me to change. Was it because I was shamed? And that persuaded me? Of course not. And so I, I now remember, listen, we're going to work off the baseline that people are inherently good when it comes to these issues. Now, how can we bring everybody in? Everybody in knowing, certainly at one point in time in my life, I was doing everything I was hoping, I'm hoping everybody else stops. And so who am I to judge anybody else? That's my mindset. Now with that mindset, here's how at least we can use that philosophy to cause real life change. When we look at legislation, what are the laws that we fight to pass? We fight to pass laws to ban the caging of farm animals. What is good about that is not only does it reduce the suffering of hundreds of millions of animals, but we don't have to persuade people to agree with us. They're already there. The wisdom of that is that we are already where people's minds are when it comes to the treatment of animals. We just have to create a bridge of that big gap between how people feel animals ought to be treated and how they actually are treated. And so they are with us in terms of how animals ought to be treated. And now what we say is, okay, you're with us. We agree with you. Every person listening in, the population in a given state, you don't want animals in cages. Excellent. You don't want them in cages either. If you agree with that sentiment, which you already do, just vote yes. We don't need to persuade you on anything. That's why we have never lost a ballot measure. We ask people to vote in a position they already have. Same thing with corporations. The corporations know that they can't go out there and tell everyday consumers that they're okay with caging animals. They know they can't defend it. And that's why we've had so much success causing corporations to change. Now, when it comes to plant-based, that's a little bit more challenging because of the reason you said. No one wants to go after my Nana's meatloaf that I was raised on when I was a little kid. But you dare ever say that she's an animal abuser. So how do we go after all those grandkids who had Nana's like me? In my mind, we do it this way. When we work in this industry, the food service industry, what we do first is this. We say, listen, we are going to provide the most delicious meals you've ever had, company, that you can add to your menus. And so no matter if someone is still loves their Nana's veal Parmesan, they're going to look at these meal offerings and think, oh my gosh, these are amazingly delicious. And we win folks over by the taste of these foods. And so when we have that goal that we talked about earlier, half the meal offerings being plant-based, we're talking about meals that are more delicious than the 50% that have animal products in it. And that, I believe, is to go back to your other question about the Tesla model. The argument about Tesla is not that you're going to get everyone to open their eyes and think, oh my gosh, we have to save the world. We should buy Tesla. No. What Elon Musk has done is, what does it look like if we just create the best car? And it happens to be better for the world. For us, it's what does it look like if we create the most delicious meals of all time in these colleges, universities, hospitals? By the way, they happen to be plant-based. And that's why we have brought professional chefs on my team, professional registered dietitians, experts in the industry, so that we don't even have to come about it with the ethical lens. It's more of, if you just want the best, go with what we're offering you here. In, in another conversation I had, I remember someone saying that ground beef has essentially been the same in the like ever since humanity started making ground beef. But all these new innovations that are coming out are getting more interesting every single day. All this innovation that's going into these new food products that are being engineered have infinite possibility for growth and improvement. And so I really like this idea that you're focusing on the additive approach. Hey, look at these new ingredients that you never had before. Look at these new options that you never had before. I think there's something really interesting there. And I think it ties really nicely into this cell cultured approach too, where I think I'm actually, I, I want to hear you touch upon that from a culture perspective really quick too. But the cell cultured movement is what they're essentially trying to say is that you are going to have the option to have meat that is cleaner, that never went through any like antibiotics, no risk of like salmonella, like all these different animal born diseases are just not even going to be a thing because they're going to be grown in like the most sterile of environments. So arguably you get a potentially better product. And while they might screw it up from time to time, you have this opportunity for innovation that we've never had 
But in the cell cultured movement, there is something intrinsically weird about eating something that's grown in a lab because it's so different from the way we've naturally approached the world. And I'm not sure taste is going to be the, the primary conversion factor. So how do you guys plan on tackling that from a culture shifting perspective? I look at it about it this way. You, know, you brought up a, a good point is, hey, something created in a lab. Like, how's anyone going to want to eat that? Well, do you know what else was created in the lab? Cheerios. I, 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 people are like, oh my gosh, what is this crazy concoction these mad scientists created? They're called Cheerios. How, I don't know how this is ever going to permeate society. If you look at almost every food you could possibly imagine, other than the whole foods out there, they're created by food scientists. And so, yes, if we're okay with eventually making cereal part of our day-to-day -day activities to eat for breakfast or eating cheese like is does cheese come about some naturally is there some cheese tree out there or do you know cows naturally just produce cheese when they're wandering out on fields like this is just been part of our culture for centuries is to innovate with food this is just something new and when i and so when i look at it this way i think about it hey did someone was someone the first person to ever eat a cheerio yes did they eventually have to give out some taste samples and have the first in line to buy Cheerios to give a thumbs up to it? Yes. I think it's going to be the same thing with this cultivated meat is that eventually there's going to be low hang fruits of folks out there who are like, hey, the first ones to want to give it a try. It's going to be served at restaurants in the United States and across the world where, where people are going to flock to be some of the first in the history of the world to ever eat this cultivated meat. They're going to be talking about it, how it tastes really good. They're going to talk about what a fun experience is to be part of the future. Then more people are going to want to try it. More people are going to want to try it. And eventually, it's just going to be part of the norm. And, and the reason why I have confidence that this is going to, to work out okay is because there was all these things that even in my lifetime and yours that we've broken through society that people thought, hey, I don't think this could ever be the norm. Cell phones. Whoever thought 30 years ago that everybody be walking around with a phone in their hand? And by the way, the phone is now a computer in your hand. We've moved so far in this society in so many different ways to think that somehow we're not going to be able to, to continue to move forward on cultivating meat because some people are afraid of it. History shows that it's just a wrong mentality to have. So yes, if it's going to taste good, it's going to win the day, especially because there is so much logic behind it. Reduce greenhouse gas emissions, reduce land usage, better for food security, because we're not going to see zoonotic diseases coming out of cultivated meat that we do coming out of factory farms. So logic is already on its side. We just have to have people try it, say it tastes good, spread the word and more people are going to buy it. And also have a few billion trillion dollars in funding for the marketing side of it. <laughs> that, that would be awful too. <laughs> which, which is invariably going to happen. I've been looking at all these trends. When you got like these meat giants like Tyson Foods and Cargyle like buying into vegan products, like that sort of indicates, oh, these guys are actually all taking it seriously and they're doing it to protect their bottom line. So these guys are purely financially motivated and there's just something really interesting there. But I loved your analogy about how so much of what we eat is already made in a lab. We just don't think about it. Like I'm thinking like gummy bears. Nobody wants to know that gummy bears are made out of ground bones and like hooves and all these body parts that nobody else wants, but they made it colorful and cute. And it looks like a teddy bear. And like, it's just like, no one ever went through that. So yes, th there is already that path that's already well trodden. Like we look at it as something so foreign, but it's happened before and it's happened successfully. I agree with you 100%. Don't just take my word for it. Listen, I'm an animal person. I've been vegan for all these years. Oh, Josh is just being hopeful. He's just a hope monger out there saying there's so much potential for good out there. Don't listen to me. Listen to Tyson that has already invested in these technologies. Listen to Tyson who's, who has a plant-based meat line. Listen to Smithfield, the largest pork producer in the world that is, is a division that's focused on, on plant-based and is invested in cultivating meat. Listen to KFC in Russia that is involved in cultivating meat that pledges to start offering, hopefully in the near future, cultivated meat at KFC. Like, are the, is Tyson Smithfield KFC, these raving vegan animal advocates hoping for a better future? Of course not. If they are embracing it, you know that there is true hope for the future that change is coming. 
Speaking of hope for the future, one of the things that I found really interesting when looking back at your journey is that you didn't just sit around waiting for change to happen. You took the time to go in and co-found a company of your own. You were just like, oh, you know what? This is taking too long. I'm going to go start something. Tell me a little bit <laughs> about how that came about with Just, which I guess used to be called Hampton Creek. Boy, that was a, that was a fun time. I, I remember to this day I, going to Minnesota to meet with General Mills. Uh, it's a company that uh, is a, a massive consumer packaging company in the United States. They use a lot of eggs. And I met with them to try to persuade them to go cage-free on their eggs. I met with a ton of executives in a big boardroom. My, the meeting went so well. I just a lot of nodding heads. Everyone 100% agreement that these chickens should not be confined in cages. But at the end, they said, you know what? We're with you. We should do something. But because the cost, we can only go to about 5% cage-free. It's just too expensive to make the shift. And I remember leaving so heartbroken. I felt like it would have been easier if these folks didn't care. And they're like, you know what, Josh? We don't even care about the treatment of animals. And so we're going to stick with eggs and case chickens. No, these folks cared and felt constrained by the system. And that's what broke my heart. And I was sitting in the, in the, the plane in a cold winter leaving the airport in Minneapolis and we we're delayed. And I was just looking out the window thinking, you know what? These are the type of folks who are executives in major food companies that don't sell products with eggs because they love the idea of eggs from caged chickens or eggs to begin with. They want to sell something. And eggs happen to be an ingredient that gets the job done in the formulation, in whatever type of protein structure they were looking for, just to make the products affordable and tasty. And I thought, you know what? If there was a plant-based ingredient instead, these companies would say, sure, why not? When we sell cookies you know, and sauces, if you could, we can replace the eggs with plants, sure, we'll do it. As long as it's affordable, as long as it tastes good and has the same functionality. So I thought that is a missing concept that has not yet been employed. And so I, I approached uh, my best buddy. His name is also Josh with this idea. Uh, we went to high school together. He wanted to be a professional football player. I wanted to be a professional baseball player. Neither of us achieved our dreams. Uh, but we became best friends in the process. And he's someone who is an entrepreneur, brilliant mind, worked for the United Nations, President Clinton, worked for President of Liberia. And he's like, hey, this is a good idea. Let's give it a shot. And so we did it. We put together a motley crew to start out a company. We came up with some early iterations of what a concept would look like to replace eggs within the food system. Went to a bunch of venture capital firms with the idea. Nothing causes someone to be more of a believer than tasting it. So they tasted some of the, the pies we created, the cookies we made, the muffins that were baked using plant-based ingredients instead of eggs. And they came to the conclusion, hey, they're onto something. And so we got initial funding. I, I still remember hitting a refresh on the bank account. And poof, the half a million dollars. That's the most money I've ever seen in my life by far in the bank account. And we were off and running. So that, that's how we started. It was very exciting. And from day one, it was about making the world better. And, uh, and it's certainly some of those months of my life are some of the most proudest. Okay, but how does... So the other Josh is called Josh Tetrick. Maybe I can just, we can just call him Tetrick for the, Sounds good. <laughs> for, for, for the purpose of this podcast. And you're Josh Bulk. But the question is, how does someone with a poli-sci degree and someone with a law degree start a food company and invent a brand new thing that's like a fundamental ingredient that most people use, like eggs and flour. How did you guys get there in six months? Like most people just go, I have no idea. Can't touch this. Too complicated. I prefer you call Josh Tetrick, Josh number two. If Josh you don't two. Mind. Okay, Josh two. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Uh, here's how you do it. You are highly motivated and obsessed. And that's what it comes down to. There was nothing that was going to get in our way to accomplish this. And so part of it was bringing together people who are a lot smarter than us when it came to science, when it came to food tech, when it came to taste. The science of taste is well beyond anything I ever thought before founding the company. You bring together great minds and you have a true obsession with winning and you can get almost anything done. And we did. When it came down to it, I swear, getting started to get involved in the investment world and, and getting funds from venture capital firms, 
one of the things they look to is that obsession with winning. And if you feel like the person is going to give it every ounce of pulse that they have in their body to get a job done, you back them. And that's what I believe. Uh, and that's what it came down to. And it's the same thing with my work, whether it's the society or anything else that I'd ever do, is that I certainly might not win every time and my team, I'm so proud of, they might not win every time. But I guarantee you, we are going to out-obsess our opposition. And that's the team that you that at the end, I think, is going to win the day. All right. Any tips for becoming more obsessed about something? <laughs> I think that's innate. Either you got it or you don't in some ways. And for me, I, I was obsessed with wanting to be a baseball player and it took a, you know, an injury to stop that dream that I had. And with Josh, he was obsessed with wanting to be an NFL player. And I don't think it was something that I was raised on. Maybe I was you know, helped by my dad to have a good work ethic and, and to have enough dignity about my output to want to reflect who I am. But listen, I wish that there was something that could be taught in some ways to everybody about that obsessive nature. But I think in some cases, that's probably a bad thing to be obsessed. But I think in, in many ways, you, you kind of sense it in somebody, whether they have the, the mentality to want to be obsessed to by any means necessary to win. I certainly don't have as much talent as other people. And Josh Tetrick is a lot more talented than I am. And fortunately, our combined charge forward that was going to go through any wall uh, to accomplish allowed us to accomplish what we did. And if it wasn't for that type of frenetic energy that was simply never going to slow, there's no way we, we could have uh, accomplished anything, especially, and you're right, with the lack of background we had in any of these areas. So if we go, if we think of obsession as a tool, um, which seems to be the one that you credit the, your most success to, and we go one step deeper than that. Was it the morality of things that was the motivating factor? Was it the possibility? Was it the potential? Was it the fact that no one else was doing it? Like, what was the underlying fuel for the obsession? For me, help animals. And for I, Josh number two? Josh number two, it was, I think, a combination. He is definitely to make the world a better place. It's animals. He cares a lot about climate change, a lot about food security issues. Also, he's a, a real strong competitive nature. And the more that anyone would doubt him, it's fuel for him. And so for him, it was a holistic obsession. For me, I'm a bit, maybe, maybe my mind is, isn't uh, big enough to have more than one focus. And so for me, it's trying to help these animals out. Like I just, I feel like, you know, I have one life uh, and I want to have the impact I can in my life. And, you know, when I look around, I've always had a soft spot for animals. Uh, I always feel so badly in my heart and deep to my soul when I see, a, see an animal suffer. And it absolutely just kills my spirit to think of so many of them by the billions who are out there that for arbitrary reasons that are unnecessary are going through absolute hell right now. And it's hard for me to take. I know... I'm personally not going to stop at all in my life. I fortunately know that I do have a team at the Humane Society of the United States and the wonderful folks at Just who are using their talents to try to make a difference. At the same time, I guess I just have this idea of like, what other choice do I have than give everything that I can for this cause? And that's what I'm doing. Yeah, when I hear you speak and, and I hear you describe Josh number two, uh, <laughs> I hear this sort of like masculine and feminine energy, like you're bringing this sort of tenderness, like this obsessive tenderness to protect and nurture. And then you have maybe Josh too, who's like, okay, let's take over the world with this tenderness. <laughs> and it seems like a really great sort of um, meshing together. I, I read a quote from Josh number two that I was wondering if you could comment on, which is he said that Hampton Creek at the time was designed to be tool agnostic. He's like, I don't really give a damn if the tools are animal cells or mung beans. I want new tools and I want to put them together and I want to figure out a way to accelerate others through these tools. And so the result of that is that Just tackles a bunch of products that are both plant-based, both cell cultivated, and it's a little bit fragmented all over the place. There's like dessert products, but there's also egg products. And so I'm wondering, do you think that having this sort of diverse approach of saying, 
oh, we just need as many tools as possible to be a strength or a weakness in today's world? When you are looking at innovation and you're trying to solve things that have never been solved before, I think it's a strength to look at many different opportunities. There's a, a bit of an arrogance that I would have had or Josh number two would have had if we had the answer right away. And we're like, but we figured it out. It's this protein and we're sticking with it. No other options that come to us we're going to even look at. I think we need a bit of humility to think if we are going to solve something that has never been solved before, as in truly replace eggs in the market as, as much as uh, products could, then we have to look at many different uh, varietals of proteins, many different ways uh, of using the proteins. And I think humility, frankly, is a good thing. Uh, and if we want to truly tackle all of animal agribusiness, by the way, not just egg laying chickens, I think it is smart to look at both plant proteins and the cultivated meat. Just it has more of a, a focus now than ever before. Really, their focus um, is their just egg, which is an egg that's sold in most major grocery stores across the country in the egg section. It's a liquid egg. You put it in a frying pan and boom, it scrambles up just like eggs. And the just folded, which is in the frozen breakfast section of Whole Foods and expanding across the country. It's kind of imagine like an omelet that's already made. You stick in the toaster, it pops out, boom, you're done. You stick it on toast and it's an egg sandwich. Those are the two areas of focus right now. So there has been more of an area of focus now. And it's going really well. In fact, the Just Folded product is the number one frozen breakfast item sold at Whole Foods. And it's the first time that I'm aware of in history that a plant-based product has ever overcame the animal-based counterparts to be the lead seller in a category in a major grocery store. The first time ever that plant-based has become number one in a category. And so they're highly successful at the same time as, as Just talks about. They have cultivated meat. I've eaten it myself. And so while I've been vegan since 2001, I've been eating meat a bit. And I've eaten some duck. I've eaten some chicken and pork. And, and I got to tell you, it tastes good. It certainly tastes good. And I will have some breaking news on this podcast. At a Humane Society of the United States fundraiser, Just gave out some of this cultivated meat to some of uh, their biggest supporters. And one of our supporters put the piece of cultivated meat down on the table as he wanted to engage in a conversation with somebody else. And Josh number two's dog came over, put his paws on the table and ate the cultivated meat, meaning Ellie, the dog, is the first canine in global history to ever eat cultivated meat. I'm so proud of her. What an angel she is. She will go down in the Smithsonian, no doubt about it. That's amazing. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. That's hilarious. I'm curious, like when you talk about Just, I, I hear your face light up. It sounds so exciting, but your face is always like animated and excited. Why do you choose to stay in the position that you are at right now? Why didn't you choose to go into the private sector as opposed to staying in, in the nonprofit arm of things? Two reasons. One is that uh, I felt that Just uh, is in good hands with Josh number two. And the folks who are working with him on the various areas of the business are way wiser than I could ever be in their roles. So I am a big fan of what they're doing, a big customer of what they're doing, and I couldn't be more proud. That's one reason. The second reason is that the team at the Humane Society of the United States is making history. We have waged the transformational campaigns that will forever change animal agribusiness. The world will never be the same because of the wins that we're able to achieve against big odds, against big interests, against incumbent industries that have never faced a force like we that we are in the history of their industries. And, and, and I, I say this humbly, but I believe it to be true. I'm not sure who else could have waged these ballot campaigns to pass these laws in states you know, like California, Oregon, Washington, Michigan, and Colorado to ban the confinement of chickens in cages. This is history-making activity. When we started this, about 3% of chickens in the egg industry were cage-free. Now we're about 30%. That's just over the last couple of years. That represents more than 80 million animals per year, 80 million animals. Like, What can we do in our lifetime to affect the lives of 80 million 
animals per year. And we were able to accomplish that. And that's just a start. We're also just got a, the first commitment from a major food service company that they are going to be offering half of all menu options to be plant-based, half of a menu. So we've achieved that initial step of a company agreeing to that. This is a type of transformational activities that our team is able to do the Humane Society of States that I'm very proud of, uh, that I don't feel, at least that I'm aware of, could have happened without the team that I'm on waging the frontline uh, frontal campaign uh, against animal agribusiness. So I'm proud of what we've done uh, and what we're doing, uh, and, and I'm sticking to it, and uh, I'm excited for the, the years to come for the achievements that we're going to to win for the animals too. So basically stick to the thing that you're best at and it, clearly you found a place where you can really truly shine. So why bother changing that? That being said, I've noticed recently while watching the Game Changers that you're an executive producer on that show. Is that a new venture of yours to get into like the influencing of culture? What was that about? You know, I don't even remember how I got caught up in that. I'm just so lucky sometimes. I really am. What a, just a moment in time in my life that somehow I met the director, Louis uh, Sohoyas, uh, who's become a dear friend, and the folks behind even the concept, James and Joseph. And I met them very early on in the, the incipient stage of this film. And I basically said, I'd love to help. And, and what they said is like, hey, if you can introduce me to folks who can you know, bring us some capital that we can actually go forward with this, you know, we'd be really thrilled. So I did, frankly, just because I felt like their idea was a brilliant one. And it was needed to have a well-done film by a director who's an Academy Award-winning filmmaker about plant-based, especially when it came down to athletes advocating plant-based. Not folks, listen, I, maybe I can go run on the treadmill for a good half hour, but who's going to care about that? But listening to professional athletes talk about why plant-based is a good thing, that didn't happen yet. And I, think, and I thought at the time that it would be, make a persuasive argument. So I connected them to a bunch of folks who I thought would be interested in funding. I, I presented the argument to those potential funders as to why I think it would be good use of, of, of their money. And uh, they followed through and they put in millions of dollars uh, into the film and I, I actually didn't really know that that would make me any type of co-executive producer. I just actually saw one day the pitch deck and my name was on there. And I was like, I didn't do it for that reason, but I'm honored to be listed. And my brother just watched it the other day and he got a big kick out of seeing my name uh, in the first few seconds of the film. And it came down to me just wanting to help and not really even understanding that it would make me a co-executive producer. <laughs> got it. Got it. Yeah, we actually had Louis on the podcast for episode eight here, where he did talk about the Game Changers and the tremendous impact it's had in, in some markets, like especially the Australian market, where I think it's hit over 10% of, of the population. And now as he was going around Australia, you, you can't even go to a barbecue anymore without having a vegan option, because at least one person out of the 10 <laughs> have seen it. So well, I don't even know if anyone's allowed to gather in groups of more than 10 anymore. But you get the point. <laughs> yeah, no yeah. doubt about it. And, and, and for, for everybody listening to this, I highly recommend it. It's on Netflix, Game Changers. It is a fun watch. That, that's the key. You know what? For so long, the animal movement, including myself, would show horrific footage, hoping people would change after watching it. But so many of us just turn our heads because you know we're empathetic. We don't want to see animals tortured. So the question is, how else can we reach people and to have a fun film that is like an easy watch, that's funny, that's informative, that's captivating and profound, deliver a message like that? I feel like uh, it's, it's one of the best things to happen in the last several years for animals. And and definitely not only watch it, bring over some friends, socially distance in your living room and enjoy the film. Yeah, for sure. Louis has got this amazing line where he says that the goal of every single one of his films is to fundamentally change the DNA of every viewer. Like that's his barometer. Mm, that's a great line. Right. And I think there's something really interesting to that. When you guys create your campaigns at the Humane Society, how are you leveraging culture in the everyday campaigns that you create? <laughs> I don't have the profound words like Louis Sahoya says of rewiring someone's DNA. What, what I can say is that I use existing DNA to support the campaigns that we are waging. 
uh, for a, a ballot campaign, where this is a political campaign, what we typically say is the following, that you love your dog, you love your cat at home. Can you imagine confining your dog into a cage where she can't turn around her whole life? And that's existing DNA we're plucking at right there. And people are like, no way, I would never do that. And so it was like, we shouldn't do it to any animal, though, shouldn't we? And they agree, yeah, why do that to any animal? And so for us, the DNA that is already out there in the world, that's good enough. That's good enough for my campaigns. And I cannot tell you how many people, when they went out and voted for that ballot campaign in California, and they voted yes for Proposition 12, did they say to uh, people volunteering in the polls saying, I'm doing this for Sam? I'm like, who's Sam? That's my dog. I'm doing it for my dog Sam at home. You know, I'm doing this for my cat at home. I'm doing it for my dog who passed away a couple of years ago as a way to give back to the animals. Existing DNA that we have is the reason why we have such a strong bond with the animals in our lives. Like, we don't need to be taught that. And I'm happy we're talking about DNA and who we are as people inherently. Because it is something that has been part of human beings since the beginning that we've ever existed. Is, it's called you know, biophilia. It's the attraction of life. When we are, are babies and little children, we want to pet a dog. We don't need to teach any kid to want to, to have an interest in petting a dog or to snuggle with a cat. It's just part of who we are. And that is enough for me. And that's one of the reasons why I do have this hope is the fact that people have been watching Disney movies about animals for decades on end. The fact that Bambi was not an animal rights movie, but it touched the heart of so many people when the poor deer were shot. Like, the fact that you can be a Democrat, independent or Republican. And when it's time to say goodbye to your dog at the vet, your heart breaks and you hold your children, and you'll never forget this animal who is part of your life. For those reasons, that's why we win the campaigns. Because all we're doing is reflecting that sentiment that already exists. I was wondering, because when I look at, when I heard you speak, like in this podcast, the way you're answering, and then I was looking at the campaigns, I was like, we don't see a lot of farm animals on your YouTube channel. You just have all these videos of koala rescues and dogs and cats and all these very relatable animals for the most part. You, you all have a couple here and there, but you're absolutely right. Don't, don't try to work against the grain of people. Work with them and show them the kind of thing that will just reinforce beliefs that are already positive and already present. So I think that's really beautiful. You, you strike me as someone who is extremely positive, right? Like you're glowing, you're excited, you're hopeful, but there have to be days in there where you feel absolutely crushed and demoralized and dispirited. What do you do to find your mojo back in those times? For me, when I needed recalibration, there have been, when I waged a political campaign, you know, there were dark days in terms of whether we're going to raise enough funds to counter opposition. The editorial board came out against us. The polling numbers didn't look so good at certain points. Those were scary days. One of the scariest days, I was on a plane to do my brother's wedding. And this is in the fall, right before the election. We got some initial polling and it looked really bad. And I felt so helpless because I was on a plane and I was going from California to the East Coast. So I felt you know, removed from what I could do to make the change. And at least what I do personally is reading to get a, a good ballast in, into my life. It, it helps remove yourself in a given situation where you are feeling sad and stressful. And it kind of just recalibrates your mind to focus on something else. And focusing on just a book helps you do that. I'm also uh, more involved in uh, mindful meditation than ever before. Basically, my morning routine is I wake up every morning at 5 a.m. I read for a half hour. I set my alarm on my phone, half hour. Then I, I meditate uh, for another 10 minutes. And then I eat a super healthy uh, breakfast, take a shower. And all of a sudden, like, that is just all I need to get ready and go in the morning, no matter what happened the day before, the night before, the week before, that's what my mind needs at least uh, to, to keep on going in a way that I think is effective. 
Good. So having routines always helps. So even during times of COVID where that baseline of expectations of what is going to happen next constantly shifts, that routine, as well as the practice of transporting yourself into a book has really helped you stabilize. Stay sane. It has. In, in fact, when you, especially when you read, like I'm reading about Lincoln right now it's a, and it's a big old thick book. It's taken me <laughs> like more than a month to get through, but I'm, I'm doing it. It's called Team of Rivals. I highly recommend it. And if you ever think that one is having a stressful day at work, reading about what Lincoln went through kind of puts things in perspective. Uh, and so having a, a way to put things into perspective also creates a calming baseline uh, approach as well. Cool. Thank you so much, man. Last question. And I feel like I already know what the answer is going to be. But if you could have a megaphone to the world and ask every person to do one thing differently in their life, what would that be? Number one, you're doing the right thing. Listen to this podcast. But other than that, what I would say is, hey, let's eat more plant-based foods. Let's try these new plant-based products out there if you haven't done it. You know what? Listen, I know we're stuck in because of COVID and we're probably ordering grocery stores for delivery and maybe we're going in a grocery store with a mask on and we're just getting through you know, the lines as quick as possible. Do me this one favor. Just one time... Get every plant-based meat you can find, just one of each. That's it. You don't need to get 10 of each, just one of each, and just see which ones you like. I guarantee you're going to dislike some, like others, and then you stick with the ones you like, and all of a sudden, you can start being part of your routine. And then from there on, have friends and family try the same products that you like, and all of a sudden, your impact is going to be compounded many times over. Hey, I think that's a, that's a baseline ask. If my brother can do it, he was eating meat almost every single meal, probably for 36 years. I'm telling you, all your listeners can do it too. Yeah, for sure. My mom just discovered the Beyond Burger. I, I, import, I imported the idea back home and it's been a big success. Good for so. you. <laughs> Good for you, mom. Good for you, mom. Alrighty, guys, that was Josh Balk from the Humane Society of the United States. If you want to follow the work that they're doing, you can find them by just searching Humane Society. On Instagram, it's at Humane Society. And it's for the most part, really cute pictures of animals. So nothing to worry about. Probably a really good way of staying aware of what is going on in the world in case you need to take legislative action inside of your state or country. I hope that you guys enjoyed this episode. I'm personally a fan of the Beyond Sausages. They're, they're, I think, my personal favorite. And there are all these new crispy chicken brands that I really want to give a shot that I just haven't, like they're just not as much choice here in Canada. But anyways, if you guys enjoyed this episode, make sure to go to impacteverywhere.org where you can find graphics, audiograms, and all that good stuff so that you can share it with your friends and spread the love. Also, if you have any time, please drop a rating on Apple Podcasts. It really makes a difference for me to keep going. Next week, we have Charlie Kleisner, who is an impact investor and the founder of Tonic. That's Tonic with two eyes, um, an entire network of wealthy individuals that have promised to pledge their dollars for good. Really excited to bring a different flavor to this podcast. It's the first time we really talk about money. So I hope you guys tune in. Have a great week. And remember that impact is everywhere.